I will start my, my talk. Uh, this is a brief outline. Uh, I will give you a little context on mutation interpretation. Uh, how we proceed usually, the tools that are available now. Uh, the development of a VR based tool. This is our ongoing research project. Uh, I will talk about its development and its performance and some future directions among which I would like to mention our idea of implementing a standardized mutation report that would support you. So, about one year ago, I had this slide, exactly the same slide. This was a very recent paper in which Green and Geyer showed their view, their evolution of uh, genomics medicine according to them, of course. Uh, they set four time intervals, right? This is the past, starting 1990 to 2003, 2004, 2010, nowadays, until 2020, and beyond 2020. And I remember I did the same thing the first talk I gave, move the chairs. <laughs> so there are these five steps this person's ambition as the five steps of the evolution of genomics medicine towards something which is just born to something which is of practical application for physicians. That is, research has reached the bedside of the patient. Now, where are we? We are in here, where we are understanding genome biology, understanding how genome may help uh, the comprehension of disease, and a little bit trying to advance medical science. This as a community, not, not ourselves, but as a community. So, as you may imagine, the big basis, the more fundamental basis for all of this to be a success, for all the previous scheme to advance, is how costly is to sequence a genome. I have this slide that I got recently from the national, it is something public, National Human Genome Research Institute, and it shows how, with time, the cost of sequencing a genome has dropped drastically, due obviously to technical reasons. Uh, techniques have advanced, and we have gone from $100 million to nowadays, where it can cost between 10000 to 5000 probably depending on the company, and it is expected to drop even more. Uh, it is expected that uh, about 2017, the cost of sequencing one genome from a patient is going to be below $100. This is important for one, for one reason. This means that uh, healthcare providers will be, more, will, be able, will, will be able to afford to pay for genomic sequencing of patients. This is an important thing, of course. But as I say in here, is there a problem? So is the picture so easy? Can we really progress in here without thinking about cost, uh, genome-related cost? And the answer is no. And let me show you something. What's happening? Interpretation cost. Interpretation cost, and I will talk now about what I mean by interpretation, is rising drastically from about $300,000 to between one, one million, half a million dollar by year 2017, which is so separated from this. And again, this is much more than probably uh, healthcare providers are ready to pay for average people. Now, these figures, these numbers, these costs are just estimates probably are an upper threshold. Some people debate that really it is about 5,000, that is three orders, of, uh, two orders of magnitudes less, uh, maybe 1,000, probably 20,000, we don't know yet. What I want to point to you is that interpretation is the problem now, not getting the, the, the sequence, rather interpreting it. And what do I mean by interpretation? This is the sequence experiment in the yellow box uh, I have done, I have put a little exon sequencing context uh, from the sample, the sequencing, the identification, the quality controls. 
this is all associated to the cost of sequencing the genome. Interpretation, both contextually and economically, starts in here, right? And what is it? This is the problem. Enormous amounts of raw data, but still very little understanding of what it means. Within the, genome, the exome sequencing context, um, interpretation means identification of disease causative variants, prioritization in the case we have many. We have to do this fast. And what does it mean fast? Maybe hours, maybe days, but nothing, no more than something between hours and days. And we have to do this reliably. That is, when this information reach a physician, he has to be sure that he can use, he or she can use it, and how they can use it, right? Reliability is an important issue. Now, if you have to do this on a routine basis, you have to do this for several exomes, I don't know, several exomes a year, or several exomes, exomes a month, I don't know the scale, how this will evolve. And you have to score between hundreds and thousands of variants per exome, you for sure have to go for automatization. We can no longer do this manually. We cannot go through 100 mutations, through 1,000 mutations, build a multiple sequence alignments, see what is conserved or not, try to check the biology of a gene. We have to do this automatically. And we have to do all the points in here. Can we do this? Do we have exome ready mutation annotation tools? And the answer is yes. And surely you know them or you have heard about them. Polyphen, SIFT, excellent tools. They are all based on the same principles. They gather a lot of mutations. They, they put together large databases of mutations. And then they learn from them. The only thing is that they learn from them automatically. It is the software they have devised or they use that allows them to build their model. Now, the performances. They are more or less, here I have five methods. This is the rock, the rock curve. Uh, this is, I have to confess, not my favorite representation, but is usually sometimes not that often in the mutation scoring field. It tells you that they more or less behave the same, probably in the default zone, that is, that part of the method that reaches the user, uh, polyphen is better, not tremendously better, but is clearly better. Although you may want to use two or three of them if you have a problem. But nonetheless, these methods are not perfect. These methods can be improved. And I would like to mention two second generation methods. One is Condel, developed by Gonzalez Perez and Lopez Vigas. Another one has got out very recently which is called Carol. Here are their performances, and no need to tell you that they are better. What they do? What do they do? Very simple thing. These are consensus methods. People just take polyphen predictions, SIF predictions, SNAP 3D prediction, and they put them together with a specific software, and they get a prediction. It behaves better, although if we have to, to decide and to tell you, OK, this is much more better, so much better, probably there are not so important differences. Anyway, there are problems with all these methods. For the consensus methods, the ones I just have told, one very clear problem is understanding of molecular damage. OK, this is something automatic. You will apply it to 100 mutants, to 1,000 mutants. But nonetheless, at the end of the day, if you have selected five variants, which you believe may be related to disease, which are of interest to you, you surely will, have, will want to make a decision, an informed decision. And for this, you have to go back to molecular damage. You have to go back to see whether this mutation or that mutation is hurting the protein in one way or, or another. Now, for consensus tools, where you play with the results of five predictor methods, this going back to the source, 
to the original molecular damage is more difficult. Plus, they depend on the improvement of the primary tools. If polyphen and sift do not improve, consensus tools will never improve, right? Or very little, maybe in the statistics. What about the primary tools, like polyphen and sift? They are conceived uh, using an average way of thinking. They were trained putting together thousands of mutations from different genes and diseases. So what they provide is an average view. Is this a problem? Well, actually, if we were moving at the level of the purest of the sciences, of the more theoretical physics where we would say, OK, we, we have reached a perfect understanding of things. If this was the case, then this wouldn't be a problem because the principles underlying mutations are the same for all the proteins. The thing is, we are not moving in this extremely pure theoretical framework. We are doing practical things that have a lot of approximations. So we want to adapt as much as we can our methodology to the systems we are working with, right? Let me tell you, for example, this is uh, from a work we did in collaboration a few months ago. Uh, actually, this was with the IMPPC, with uh, Maika Fernandez, Maika Sanchez, uh, and it was the scoring of one mutation for this protein. This mutation, glycine 792, replaced by arginine, right? We did a homology model. We were able to trace the mutation to the protein interface. And this is where I wanted to have you, the protein interface. Protein interactions may vary from one protein to another. In some cases, they may be uh, channeled through hydrophobic patches. In other cases, through hydrophilic. They are different. And average methods may miss these subtleties. For example, in the case of Fabry disease, this is a collaboration with Juan, with Israel, with Carmen. Uh, in which we have scored, or we are working in the scoring of uh, a little more than 100 mutations causing Fabry disease. And for example, one of these mutations is this, one of the residues mutated a couple of times has been described, is the cysteine that forms a, cis a disulfide bridge. Right. Uh, this, the impact of this kind of mutation may depend on several things that are protein specific, system specific size, for example, how secondary structural elements talk to each other. And this is very specific because this may change from one protein to another. That is, there's something that present predictors are missing. They are doing this. They are taking a gene, taking the known pathological mutations and sending to, or using them to build a mutation predictor, the same for gene 2, gene 3, etc. That is averaging. What we propose is the following. Do build a mutation predictor for each gene. That is, the mutation, the knowledge we have about the biochemistry, about the sequence of the evolution of this gene, we use it for this gene to build a very specific predictor. We don't know whether this is going to work better or not. This is our idea. This is at the core of our project. Of course, it is based on some preliminary results, not only from our group, uh, from Torcamanis, uh, from Alfonso Valencia, uh, from Roland Dumbrak, etc. But this is from our group. Uh, what I'm showing you in here is three proteins, the number of pathological mutations that cause this, uh, the diseases associated to these proteins, neutral mutations, and performance of the method. And we can see that for all of them, we are around 95%, 97% success rate, right? There's one difference between them which is the performance relative to something ra random. That is, if we just had a lottery machine that would assign mutations at random to pathological and neutral, this is much better than this lottery. This also, this not that much. And why? 
because we do not have pathological mutations to learn. So these are the limits of our method. Nonetheless, we thought it was worthwhile trying it. So I'm going to go now to introduce you a little bit to the methodology we have followed to develop this predictor, uh, this gene-specific predictor. Do not worry. Uh, it's not going to be uh, technical. Though, however, I believe it is important that you have a feeling of what we do. Because if uh, you become subsequently users of either this method or, for, or of other methods, this really I don't mind, it is important that you know what is inside. And what is inside? This is the whole idea of predicting pathological mutations. You have a mutation and you assign a series of properties to this mutation, right? And then with these properties, you look at them and you decide, well, this is damaging structure, this is damaging sequence, etc., etc. We decide it is pathological. Or we do not see any damage. We decide it is neutral. This is the whole idea. A more precise scheme of what we are doing is this one. We start by data mining, learning from mutations, characterizing protein damage, and build our model. Then we can close the circle by applicating, applying, sorry, going back to data mining, or you may choose to validate experimentally this information to use it for counseling, whatever. There are several options. I will go very quickly through these main points. The data mining, that is, getting pathological mutations on a given gene or disease to learn from them, to be able to distinguish them from neutral mutations. We use four approaches from general databases where many mutations are stored, like Uniprod and Omim. They are redundant also. From specific databases, like this one for Fabry disease, this one for, for P53. From literature, because not surprisingly, research from the 80s, research from the 70s, and part of it from the 90s has not been yet stored or, or will not be never stored into the general databases or maybe into the specific databases. So it is always nice to have a look at the literature. And I have to tell you that this is one point where we have, get, we, we have got a lot of help from you because for us it is sometimes very difficult to follow the specific literature, sometimes, almost always, to follow the specific literature from diseases. We don't know about diseases. This is not our research field. Everybody here has been very helpful. And then another important point, which I would like to stress for you, institution mutation collections. In many institutions, after years of research, groups uh, that have a knowledge on a specific disease uh, have a set, a very nice collection of mutations. Uh, and this is an important source that not always is reaching the general databases and that we honestly would like to benefit from in here. Uh, we have already ha been helped a lot in this sense. The Fabry disease is an important case. Uh, and this is the one in which I have focused this presentation. Now, you remember my scheme. We were learning, that is, retrieving mutations. Then we were uh, labeling them according to the damage they cause, damage, and then the method. Let me talk a little bit about damage. OK, what do we talk about when we speak about damage? How a mutation is weakening a protein, right? The protein may, re may retain the structure, but is weaker, right? how a mutation affects functional interactions. They do not talk the same between them proteins, which are normal partners, plus aggregation problems, etc., etc. This seems hard to, uh, to transform into a series of simple numerical properties, and it is. Nonetheless, we were very lucky that in the end of the 70s up to the 90s, year 2000, there was an important, a very important effort in protein engineering, particularly in the site-directed mutagenesis of proteins. The goals were very varied. People were working, trying, for example,
to see how they could stabilize proteins and signs particularly to make them more resistant to high temperatures, to use them, for example, in washing processes at high temperatures. There were other problems, surely. And from these studies, a set of empirical rules about what is a good mutation and what is a bad mutation appeared, right? We learned how bad it was to break the sulfide bridges, the burial of charges, uh, to touch protein structure at certain loca locations was very bad, etc. And completely apart from this, evolutionary, evolutionary information. There are thousands of papers, literally thousands of papers, where people has described and has analyzed and has understood mutations in terms of how conserved was a position in a, pro, in a given protein family. Uh, all these, these empirical rules plus the evolutionary information were used, we, we used them to devise three families of properties to label our mutations. The more simple, sim sequence base, which are, for example, if we replace something big by something small or vice versa, how damaging is this for the protein structure? Structure based, uh, the mutation happens here or happens here, and evolutionary based properties. I won't go through these two first sets of properties. Either they are very simple and you can understand them just by looking at them, or they involve very complex computations, which is nonsense to go through them now. Nonetheless, I would like to stress one thing. We use as simple properties as we can. I would like, though, to speak two words about evolutionary properties. Because even if you do your own analysis, no need for automatiz automatization. They are very important. I tell you from now that these are the most characteristic properties you can use to distinguish pathological from neutral mutations. Make a multiple sequence alignment of a given protein family, look where this mutation happens, and then see if it breaks the conservation pattern or not. This is simply stated, <clears throat> but it is as, as I said. Just let me go very quickly through it. Why multiple sequence alignments are so relevant? Imagine, we compare two kinases. One is from human, the other is from fish, or from a given insect. We see nothing. They are removed, they are far away, they have low similarity. I am unable to see any signal. I don't know how to interpret things using this alignment. However, when we have a multiple sequence alignment, here we have from chicken, from dog, from cat, from fish, from insect, from human, uh, from pig, whatever, a signal starts to appear. Some residues are more conserved than others. This is a signature of the family. This is related or has been related to protein function, protein structure, probably folding processes, and a part of chance. But this is why they are so useful. Re conservation is highly related to function and conservation of function. This, I just put it to let you know that we have a protocol for building multiple sequence alignments. We can talk about it if you want to, to use it. Uh, this is why I put it in here. I don't want to put it to go through it uh, and explain it every point. It is simple because, as I said before, we are trying to do things as simply as we can, as easy to check, to validate, and to criticize as we can. Right? This is one example of the collaboration with, with uh, Ricardo and his colleagues. This is for GATA2. This is the multiple sequence alignment. Just to show you, just to show you that the alignment looks nice. This is far from easy. Of course, if the family is conserved, this is much easier. But the filtering of the sequence is deciding which one enters and which one goes away is not that trivial. Finally, I am almost at the end of the methods. The predictor. We took seven properties, right? You remember the original scheme. We had mutations. We characterized them with several properties. We kept seven. Sequence base, 
uh, structure base, and the most important of all, multiple sequence alignment base. Now, the program, the method. We didn't program anything. We didn't program any machine learning, any ultra sophisticated program. We use a standard. There's a nice standard, which is the Weka package, which provides you with tools that learn. Programs that their goal is to train them, well, we can use them to train them on a specific problem, like the one of distinguishing pathological from new, neutron mutation. And if properly trained and validated, they may be very powerful. Validation is a very important issue, and we are always considering how to validate, how to see where our failures are. Failures are very important for us because this is the source of our improvement, right? This is just a performance metrics. Uh, I just put it to remember me that it is not a conventional measure, but very much used in the field of scoring mutations. And now let's see the results we get. We have seen the methods. Let's see the results. The focus will be in Fabry disease. Fabry disease has been like a workshop for us. We have taken these mutations, we have looked at them, we have built multiple sequence alignments, we have studied them as best as we could, we have been clearly favored by the presence and by the collaboration of Juan, of Israel, and Carmen. And with this knowledge, we have tried to build a predictor. I will shortly go through the discriminant power of the parameters I told to you before, and then the performance of the method. If you let me just one second. Now, one of the parameters, what I'm showing here to you. If we have a property that would allow you to completely discriminate between neutral and pathological mutations, if we plot, a, if we then would plot a population of pathological, like in here, and neutral mutations, we would see two distributions completely separated, one from the other. Of course, with some statistical noise, but they would be separated. For amino acid volume, this is not the case. Both pathological and neutral mutations do have similar profile regarding to the change in volume. So this property while it may bring some knowledge, is not a good discriminator between, between mutations. But then let's go to residue conservation. You remember our multiple sequence alignment conservation degree. And what do we see? Here we plot conservation degree in, I don't know this color. In lilac, uh, we have pathological mutations. And in blue, we have neutral mutations. And you see what I was telling you before. There's a separation. It is not perfect. It is not perfect. And we are the first to recognize it. But nonetheless, if we draw a line in here, and we draw a line in here, or in here, we can make, I would say, good predictions of what is pathological and what is neutral. Now, it is important for us to do this analysis before. Why? Because we don't want to go through the, through the effort of training a method of doing uh, the, the careful analysis without knowing that we have something at least to work on, right? A good starting point. Now, let's see the performance. Again, the rock curves. I put them <laughs> for the last time. Uh, here is our own method in red, uh, polyphen and sift. Uh, it shows a slightly better behavior early. Uh, the area of under, under the curve, I don't have it in here, but it's slightly better. However, I will focus in one part, or I will look at performance in one way. The way users look at performance. We have, we have had for several years our method, which I would not advise to use now because there are better methods uh, in the web, and we got some input from the, from the users. And what users, and rightly so, are interested in knowing is, okay, I will use default parameters, 
because my main job is not to go through a lot of technical stuff. What I want to do is to have a score for this mutation uh, using your default parameters and, see, and understand how reliable it is, right? How reliable is, is your prediction? This means that we, have, we are working in here. The decision to work in here was not, taking, was not taken afterwards we saw the results. That is, is not that we wait to see our results and to see, oh, it, it looks better in here. We will work in here. No, no, no. This is before. And how I'm going to show you the performance? I'm going to show you two things, right? One is the overall performance. This is a raw measure of how many times we are successful when we predict something, when we predict a mutation. It's raw, but it's very typical to use. Uh, but it also very approximate, because uh, if you have an imbalance between classes, it may be very misleading. What do I mean by a, a imbalance between classes? That you have many more mutations that are pathological than neutral, then if your method says everything is pathological, the overall success rate will look okay just because there are many more. Anyway, overall success rate, approximate performance measure, how do we look at this? This is a comparison between the best performer we got in the specific case of Fabry disease, right? This is not polyphen as it comes out of the paper, as it is put on the web in general average over proteins. These we applied specifically to the mutations in alpha galactosidase. And this is our own method. And how do we read this graph? There's a line in here. Above, we are doing better than polyphen. Below, we are doing worse than polyphen. And as you see, in general, for success rate, we are doing better than polyphen, in general. Right? Performance over random. Remember, the lottery. We have a lottery machine. It's saying randomly this mutation is pathological, this one is neutral. How better are we doing relative to this lottery? Again, polyphen in here, our own method in here, there's a, re a black line in here, above we do better, below we do worse than polyphen. And as in the previous case, a majority of points are above telling that our own method is in general working better than polyphen. Were we excited about this? Well, I have to confess that yes, because this just came after many tests and, and we were concerned and we were saying, this has to work, this has to work, but at some point we, we, we weakened a little. And we continued just because of the strength of my group members that are very stubborn. So, we have in here what it is a promising result. So we decided to pursue we decided to try in another gene, my age seven, right? And to build a specific predictor for this gene, this is the beta cardiac myosin heavy chain. This is a big protein, uh, 1,400 amino acids. Mutations uh, have been described to cause familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy one. Uh, as I said, uh, I just mentioned it because you have to know it about the disease, I am sure that you know much more than ours, than us. Uh, the mutation data set, remember, we work in specific mutation data sets, we work, we produce specific methods. We got 74 disease causing mutations obtained most from Uniprotanomim and validated and compared with cardiogenomics database and 45 neutral mutations from multiple sequence alignments. I won't go in three. So, what was the performance? What do you say? Better or worse than polyphen? So this was, this was done yesterday. <laughs> so we were slightly, uh, I was slightly worried uh, because we had done a lot of effort with the Fabry mutations. Uh, we have to do our best to be clean, not to put not to mix information, not to say things that are not, but you are never sure. We believe that our performance in Fabry is reasonably clean and when we give you the cross-validated figures while 
always in any in any field they tend to be a little bit over optimistic i believe that they are realistic so when we arriving here i felt well what will ha what will happen and what happened is this that when we compare performance overall success rate for our method versus polyphen the trend was reproduced uh, again there were more cases or more versions uh, of the method for which we were doing better than polyphen. Performance over the lottery, over random, again, the same trend, right? The method was working in the direction we expected. So here is the summary of what I have shown to you. This is the overall success rate, sensitivity, specificity, and Matthew's correlation coefficient. Shown in, in orange are the two proteins we have studied for which we have developed a specific method, alpha-galactosidase, MyH7, and here are the results of polyphen, except for this case that I very quickly point to you where they are better, slightly better than us. Uh, for all the figures, we are doing better than them. This doesn't mean that we are going to be better than them always. Not at all. We don't know. We have to check it gene by gene. And of course, there's one thing we are ready to do. We are ready to learn from polyphen. And we are ready eventually, or at some point, if we believe it is better to build consensus method between our method and polyphen's method. We don't know. We do not discard nothing. The only thing I would like to stress to you is that it seems to work. It wouldn't be so surprise, surprising because we had results before but nonetheless we were very glad now what is what are future directions for this work of course i am sure you were thinking about this extended to more genes this is when it will become useful for exome sequencing right uh, also one case which i am sure you also have noticed and if the gene doesn't have enough mutations enough mutations to train a method. Well, we have an idea stored, which will be the, which is reserved for another talk in the, in the near future, right? This, but then other things that we believe may be useful for you, and you have to guide us. You have to tell us if we are wrong or not, and it's try to predict degrees of phenotype, severity, uh, whether w we can say, okay, if this mutation is really disease causing, is this going to cause a very severe phenotype of the disease or a milder, a milder phenotype? Frankly, we have started to do this with Fabry. Just like 10 or 15 days ago, we saw a signal above noise. That is, we are very early and our results, although make us think that we are in the right direction, but are not yet uh, good enough to show them. We don't know whether we will be able to say something useful to you or not. We believe so, but we don't know yet. So, summary. I have talked to you about the methods one uses normally to score variants in exome projects. I, we have seen that they have some limitations and that there's room for improvement. We are developing, given this hypothesis, a new method gene-based method that we believe is going to be useful and give interesting information. And it is conceived to work large scale. This is not a method conceived, although in its origin is gene-specific. It is conceived to be a high-throughput scoring method. It is very fast. So we have not programmed the, 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 the algorithm. It is fast because very nice programmers at the Weka which is in New Zealand, at the Weka Consortium have done an incredible job, right? But the reality is that it is very fast. But it also may be useful for single mutation analysis. So we are almost at the end of the, of the talk. And I call this working together. We have learned a lot. The method we have devised has benefited a lot from the collaborations we have had. So for this reason, I wanted to tell you, if you are interested in contributing to this effort, 
if you feel you can point us to some errors or to some mutation collections that are worthy of study, we will be more than glad to work in them. This is working together. Also, not only thinking in terms of large, massive projects, also thinking in terms of very specific projects. Here are the results, the graphical results of some of the collaborations we have done uh, with our colleagues here at Beer. After working through them, after going through them, an idea has started to appear, and it's the idea of building a standard a report. We have got very nice input. At present, we have done a lot of work with uh, Ricardo, with uh, Roger, and Monica in this direction. We have presented them with some reports, some ways in which to present a mutation damage that are that could be easily standardized, that, that you could use, all of you, to go through them and see whether you have identified all the causes of molecular damage, at least the most frequent, which could help you in your research, right? We are just working in this. This has, this has a very applied uh, side to it. Uh, and for this reason, we believe it is also a community effort. We believe that this idea of a mutation uh, damage uh, report may advance, may progress. We could try to do it by ourselves, but really, really, it could benefit a lot from your help. And to finish, who was responsible for the good parts of these works? Uh, I am responsible for the bad parts. I take this responsibility. But my group, these three people in here, fantastic guys, they are smart, they work hard, and they are very kind to work with. So I am very proud of them. But of course, all this effort, all the effort we, I have shown you, all the results I, ha I have shown you, would have, would have been completely impossible without the help of people here at Beer. I list them in here uh, from the neurovascular disease, uh, the neuroscience area, Joan and Israel, from the nanomedicine, you will forgive me, <laughs> Carmen, uh, of lysosomal storage diseases, TV in nanomedicine, Maria Carmen Dominguez, uh, from the immunology group, Ricardo Pujol, Monica Martinez, Roger Colobran, from the neuromuscular and mitochondrial pathological, pathology, sorry, neuroscience, Elena Garcia and Tomas Pinos, from the outside of here, uh, from the IMPPC, the Cancer and Iron Group, Maika Sanchez and Ricky Shoshi. And here we are starting a collaboration, a very exciting project, with the group of biomedicine and translational and pediatrics oncology, uh, with Jaume Raventos, Eva Colas, Andreas Dol, Marina Rigao, and Marta Garcia. This will also or could be eventually the, the subject of another talk. Without the funding bodies, we, we could have done nothing. I really appreciate the support of Bay Lebron, ICREA, and uh, all Ministerio de Ciencia e Innovación. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, two, two questions. First, there is uh, any, any clear points to be sure when a mutation is going to do the protein completely unusable, that is the cell mm -hmm. degrades the protein, because we have some mutations in, in which, uh, especially in, in, membrane pro in membrane proteins, that the, the mutation causes the protein that doesn't express at all. Doesn't express. Or is it expressed but very express unstable? Express the protein. Not, not, not uh, that is, uh, they don't appear in, right. in, the, in the membrane. Right. This is one question. One question. And the other is, 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 is uh, op an opinion for... Uh, of course. It's only if... Uh, you consider that the molecular dynamics has nothing to do in, in the analysis of the mutation? No. Okay, we'll start by the, by the last one, which is faster to do. Of course, ideally, 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 ideally. And, we were, and if we were not thinking in uh, high throughput methods, molecular dynamics, very accurate modeling of the protein structures would be the way to go. So this I am sure. But there are problems. Molecular dynamics are not yet accurate enough to predict in an easy way or without a very large computational effort 
whether a mutation or to which degree a mutation would be pathological. I do not mean destabilizing because some mutations are pathological because they involve a gain of function, right? And this is hard to tell from molecular dynamic simulations. We are doing molecular dynamic simulations, actually. So, and I love them. And I worked for a long time with Modesto Rothko in his work, who is uh, a defensor of MD. But nonetheless, for this kind of project, uh, I believe that it is better to have an approximate method, an approximate method, which may work very fast, plus a well-defined error bar. That is, we are, not we are not going to be as precise, as fine, and, and, as, and, we, and we are not going to understand as well the real cause of mutation. But we will be able to do it for many mutations, and because we are going to have an error bar, hopefully people will be able to go through them very fast. Molecular dynamics is passioning, but I see that in this context it's harder to, to integrate. For the moment, it may be, then in a future it may be integrated. But as I say, we use it, but we do not see it in the context of this, of this kind of project. Now, the other question, which was about expression, and this is another thing we have learned from being in here. We were very, uh, we were very protein focused, but since we came in here, the issues of expression of whether a protein is expressed, uh, forgetting about the problem of whether it is going to be stable or not, uh, we are starting to integrate this. Now manually, we are not doing anything automatic. Now just trying to look for NM NMD signals, which is the most obvious, obvious thing to look at. Uh, whether, uh, for example, mutations leading to a deletion introduce an early stop codon that itself channels the protein through NMD degradation pathway. And maybe we are trying to include other things. But in this, which is a mechanism which has been described to happen in disease, we don't know yet enough to have a, a quantitative method. We want to learn, and we need to work together with you. And if you are interested, this is something we, we yeah, as I said, we are ready and eager to do research on it. But this is not like, for example, the prediction of pathological mutations in proteins, in which we feel very comfortable because we have been working for, for many years. But we are glad to do something. Israel? Uh, based on the results of the ENCODE project and also the results of the, um, of the GWAS in, in these last years, that we know really that in the intergenic regions, there are <coughs> in the inter intergenic regions, there are a lot of polymorphisms and mutations that affect the, the genes that are next to these, to these polymorphisms and mutations. Do you know really if um, tools like Polyfem or your tools could really uh, describe the pathological, um, if the polymorphisms right. or the mutation are pathological in these intergenic regions? No, the, the short answer is no. Neither Polyfem nor SIF nor none of the tools I have shown in, in here, including our own, are able to predict nothing which is which happens in the in the inter-region, the intercoding region, uh, so in the parts of the of the genome that do not code for protein, these methods are strictly based on conservation and on some physicochemical properties of proteins, including structure. So, as I said, the short answer is no. There's a possibility. There are some regions that are conserved. And at some point, we may think about looking at them and see the conservation through species. But this is a more open field. Um, we don't know about it. We don't know of efforts that perform as well uh, as, for example, without mentioning our method, as, for example, polyphen, right? 
uh, for these intercoding region areas. This will be developed uh, for sure because it's an important issue, but but there's no, I think the probably the, the thing which is stopping us more is that there is not so much uh, knowledge about this as it was for proteins. You remember all the site-directed metagenesis experiments I mentioned before, this was paramount for, for, for our method and for other methods. There's nothing such as this for, for non-coding regions. Hopefully there will be. Relate to the um, uh, performance of your test. Mm -hmm. um, in our case, we when we throw, we, we find um, missense mutations that we we have no da data about um, uh, pathologic effect. We first um, use polyphen, sift, mm -hmm. and, and others. And uh, every year, appear in the literature new new softwares or new mm -hmm. programs, and. Do you think that our um, after all these programs, the, they, their predictions need uh, to be confirmed in, uh, by functional assays? Or in the future, we will have a unique and, and a special tool that allows not to do functional assay, yeah. to be applied in clinical setting? OK. At present, there's no such a tool, for sure. Uh, the most important thing when you run, you run a predictor is not only the prediction, it's also to check for your error margin, which usually comes in terms of a probability. The probability of being damaging, the probability of being neutral. This is your best tool. Never use a, a score from polyphen or from SIFT or, or from other methods without having the reliability by your side. This will never substitute a decision by a person, at least in, in the near future, for sure. Because there, there are not good models to combine this information with more clinical knowledge and reach a decision. I only see these methods as a guidance, which may be very good at some point, if the reliability is very high, for example. But if lives are at stake, and I don't want to, dra to dramatize because you are much more closer to patients than I am, but when important decisions that affect people are at play, I would go for some kind of validations, this for sure. Uh, we are fighting to reach a point where we we can be very uh, deciding where we can have the tools that really help you to think in other things, to think, say, in terms of transplantation, or you don't have to worry about what the mutation does. But we have not reached this point yet, to be honest. And to be honest also, I don't see that in the first five to 10 years we are going to reach it. 